You may be seated. And I invite you to bow your heads and hearts with me for a moment of prayer. Heavenly Father, Almighty God, Lord, you draw us here this day, for we are your dearly beloved children. We have been brought into your family through the waters of baptism. You have redeemed us and cleansed us of all of our sins and given us this tremendous gift called faith. Lord, help us to cherish that faith, not as a work that we do or something that we accomplish, but a gift from you. And Lord, when we falter, when we are feeling like our emotions or our tongues are leading us astray, help us to remember that you are there beside us and that, Lord, you can do all. So I ask you to be at the words of my mouth and the meditations of all the hearts that are gathered here together that we might be and abide in your presence. And all God's people said, Amen. Well, grace, mercy, and peace be unto all of you from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. How's your faith doing today? How is your faith? If it was like a scale of zero to ten, maybe some of you are saying, yeah, I feel like I'm like a nine today, maybe a, a ten. If you're like, I'm really close to the Lord. I, I know his presence. I know his promises. I am confident. Or maybe you're more like a one or a two. You know, I feel like things aren't going so well and God seems to have forgotten about me and all my plights and struggles. I think if we're honest, we're probably somewhere in the middle, aren't we? And if we're truly honest, we kind of, kind of go back and oscillate between the highs and the lows many times throughout the day, depending on what happens in our lives, depending on maybe how things go or don't go in our favor, based upon what someone says or doesn't say. It's then that the words of the Father in our text can become our own. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, you remember the context of this uh, statement, right? Let me draw you back there. Jesus takes with him Peter and James and John up a mountain, and there he is transfigured before them. He reveals all of his divine glory and power to those three disciples. It's an amazing event. But where are the other nine? They're still back down at the base of the mountain. And then a man comes along, a father, who wants Jesus to heal his possessed son. But Jesus isn't there. His disciples are. And so since they were there, they thought, well, we can handle this. I mean, they had done it before. When Jesus sent them out two by two, they came back in amazement saying, even the demons are subject to us in your name. So the disciples can handle this, right? wrong. You see, they tried, and they tried, and they tried. But this unclean spirit wasn't leaving. And now a crowd was growing. And in the crowd were these religious leaders called scribes. They had been looking for something to make fun of Jesus, to, to kind of show that he wasn't the guy, to, to kind of mock him. He's not there, but his disciples are. And so they start to criticize the disciples. And as you can imagine, an argument ensues. And the crowd grows and things get out of control. It's then that Jesus and Peter and James and John come back down the mountain. And I could almost imagine Jesus seeing his disciples and the scribes and the crowd all arguing with each other, kind of smacking his head and saying, Oh, faithless generation, how long am I to be with you? How long am I to bear with you. Now, I got to say, I feel sorry for the disciples. I mean, while Peter, James, and John were up on that mountain seeing the most amazing things with Jesus, the rest of them were left down below to contend with fickle crowds, a demon, and religious critics. I mean, when Jesus comes back, what does he do? He chastises them. It just doesn't seem fair. I mean, yeah, sure, the religious leaders, they don't seem to believe Jesus, but the disciples do, and they're trying their best. I mean, they really are. They're trying their best. But therein lies the problem. You see, they fell into the same old trap that Moses and David and Solomon and so many others have as well. They thought they were responsible for the successes, and they struggled. And, you know, we too can fall into that same trap. Time and time and time again, I hear people describe faith as a choice one makes. They're a decision, or maybe an experience or a feeling they have, or even something they do, like 
persevering. Now, I'm sure that one time or another, you have said, you just got to have faith. Like, faith is the object of faith. That's like having faith in faith. Not faith in Jesus, not faith in God's word, not faith in God's promises. Instead, what you're doing is you're putting your faith in your own will, in your own conviction, in your own power. And that's what the disciples did. To give you a visual, it looks kind of like plugging a surge protector into itself. It might look right, but nothing's going to happen with anything that's plugged into it, right? Well, that's what the disciples look like. An attempt to cast out that unclean spirit, it didn't involve prayer in faith or Jesus' promise. Rather, their faith was in their own abilities. Now, there's this modern fallacy that goes something like this. It doesn't matter what you believe, just as long as you believe something, which sounds good to our modern ears and sounds very politically correct. But when you take it to something that's not spiritual, you realize just how ludicrous it sounds. Like, it doesn't matter who you trust with your money, just trust someone with it. Well, that's not smart, is it? And if there's a difference between how, who we trust with our worldly wealth, isn't it more important on who we trust with our heavenly wealth? You see, if we trust in ourselves, our quality of faith, our works, for our eternal well-being, well, we're going to find ourselves in the same situation as those disciples were. I mean, too often we think, I got this. I can handle this. But then we realize that God's law requires absolute, absolute perfection, which means one sin, one little indiscretion, and we're all doomed. You see, we, if we put our faith in ourselves— we're trying to do the impossible. We're going to face God's wrath. So once we realize we can't trust in ourselves, we might start to look at other things to trust in. Maybe things like science, medicine, technology, and the list can go on and on and on. And that seems like what the Father did in our text today, right? Jesus asked the Father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And it's often cast him into the fire and into the water to destroy him. No doubt this father had spent years, years, looking for help for his child. And the world probably offered all sorts of potential cures. But none of them worked. In the same way, we can search the world for all sorts of things to trust in. You know, lifestyles that we think might bring fulfillment. People who we think are going to give us love. But none of them will. Only Jesus, the Son of God, is able to save us and give us eternal life. Only Jesus loves us unconditionally and sacrificially. I know we want to believe it, but it's difficult at times when things are not looking like they're going like we think they should. I mean, the Father knew the difficulty of believing and yet struggling in unbelief. He'd been disappointed so many times before by so many others, even by Jesus' own disciples. So he begs Jesus, if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You see, Jesus sees the Father's crisis of faith, and in compassion, he helps him, as well as his disciples and us, overcome unbelief. You see, Jesus' promise that he can do anything reveals his divine power. Divine power over evil spirits, over sin, even over death. And it refocuses the disciples' faith. Likewise, he comes to us today to refocus our faith upon him and his promises. You see, just as Jesus dealt with that unclean spirit, he also deals with every single one of our sins. He doesn't tell us to believe more, to sh strive harder, to work more. No. He did all the work for us on Calvary's cross. There he carried all of our sins. And he received the punishment that we deserve so he might purchase our forgiveness. You see, Jesus conquered sin with his suffering on the cross. And his death, he conquered death because he rose from the grave. And yet we still live in this sinful world, don't we? And we can face struggles that often lead us to disbelieving. Saying things like, Lord, if you can, if you really have the power to do it, 
His response, all things are possible for the one who believes. You say, but Lord, this is different. I really screwed up. Again, he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. You say, but Lord, I've done everything. I just couldn't do it. I lost my faith. Again, he says, all things are possible for the one who believes. But, but, there's no buts. There's no buts. There's no limits to what Christ can do for you. There's no limit to the power that he shows us through Calvary's cross. You just need to be still and know that he is God and trust in his promise. All things are possible for the one who believes. But here's the question. How do I know that my faith is strong enough to to grab hold and hang on and cling to that promise? Well, that's the lie the devil tries to tell you, to get you to lose your faith. It's this misguided thought that somehow our faith is something that we produce in ourselves and that our salvation depends upon us. This lie gets us looking inward at ourselves, navel-gazing, if you will, thinking about our experiences, thinking about our strength, thinking about our convictions, thinking about our decisions. And we start comparing ourselves to others, thinking this is how it should be. But remember, faith is not our work. It's a gift of God. No one can say Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. So just as the Father had to bring his Son to Jesus, the Holy Spirit needs to bring us to Jesus, to plug us in to his power, to his promises. And that's what he does. When he baptizes us, he plugs us in to Christ. When he feeds us here with his very body and blood, he plugs us in to Christ. When he speaks his word to us, he plugs us into the promises and power of Jesus Christ. Therefore, it's not about your experience. It's not about your conviction. It's not about your strength or your ability. No, it's always about the power of Jesus. Which brings us back to that Father's prayer. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. Now, when we pray this prayer, we acknowledge our weakness, our helplessness, and we beg God to help our unbelief in the one who makes all things, even our salvation, possible. And we cling to his promise that he would be the one who will keep us in that true faith until that day that we join with him in his heavenly kingdom. So I began asking today, how is your faith? Maybe an appropriate answer would be, and always would be, the response of the Father. Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. In Jesus' name, amen.